Benzuguru pay my CD hogan, all now hogan Benzuguru pay my CD hogan, all now hogan Benzuguru pay my CD hogan. Hello everyone, happy Sunday. You all look so spring like today. It's two o'clock, Sunday afternoon, and thank you for attending my uh, weekly Dharma talk. Let me just put some information about me in the chat. There we go. Oops, that's not it. Sorry about that. Just give me one second. Okay, there's some information about me. I'm not going to go through it. Um, except to remind people that if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them during the course of the chat, rather than saving your questions towards the end. So today we're talking about the 23rd, so this is the 23rd talk in our series on the Digha Nikaya, the first um, book of the uh, Siddha Pitaka, of the second, which is the second part of the uh, Pali Canon. And we're discussing the 23rd Siddha, which is called the Payasi, uh, Siddha, the conversation with Payasi. This week's Siddha is one of only two Siddhas in the Digha Nikaya where the Buddha is not present. The other is the Subha Siddha, which is the tenth uh, Siddha in the Digha Nikaya, in which uh, Subha asks Ananda to summarize the things that the recently deceased Buddha praised. And of course, we've covered that uh, previously in our series. The Payasi Siddha records a sermon given by Kumara Kasapa, that is the young Kasapa, not to be confused with Maha Kasapa, who convened the first Buddhist council. The venerable uh, Kasapa was the best preacher in the Buddhist Sangha, or reputed to be such. That a Siddha uttered completely independently of the Buddha was deemed to be canonical provides an important insight into the question of what constitutes dharma, a question that is addressed in other suttas also, and we've actually discussed this previously. Clearly, the Buddha Vachana is not limited to the words of the historical Buddha. Therefore, the utterances of third parties can constitute an authentic canonical dharma tradition. Thus, the view that only the words of the historical Buddha constitute the Buddha Vachana uh, a view which is held by uh, some extreme fundamentalists, is uh, an adharmic hermeneutic, according to the Pali Canon itself. The Sutta makes extensive use of parables. Yeshua, the proper name uh, of Jesus, subsequently popularized the use of spiritual parables about 400 years later. In this talk, I'll be focusing more on the intellectual content of the Sutta rather than the stories, which are uh, fairly uh, obvious. I will, however, include some references to the stories for those who have not actually read the Siddha, so you'll get a, a little bit of a flavor of the parables without actually, without us actually going into them in minute detail. Traveling through Kosala, uh, the, the, the uh, Republic of Kosala, which we've uh, encountered uh, in, in previous Siddhas, traveling through Kosala with many monks, Kasapa came to be staying in the uh, Sangsapa forest, north of a town called uh, Setavya, described as a wealthy agricultural town that had been given by King Pasanadi of Kosala to Prince Payasi. And we've encountered towns that have been, uh, that are, have been given to uh, uh, Brahmins or others before uh, in the Suttas. It appears to have been a fairly common, common uh, political structure in the 5th century BCE in India, in the northeast, where the Buddha lived. You may recall an earlier Sutta where the main character, also the governor of a town, developed the evil opinion, uh, described as such, that unfettered selfishness is the highest good and that altruism ought to be abandoned. Those of you who have att been attending my talks may recall that Sutta as well, which we have also discussed. Clearly, this was an early incarnation of Ayn Rand. Now, in this Siddha, we have Prince Payasi developing the evil opinion that there is, are no other world, no devas, and no karmic consequences. You can see uh, in the civilization of 5th century uh, Northeast India, 5th century BCE, Northeast India, 
that dissident views, skepticism, and even materialism were flourishing, somewhat contrary to our conventional notion of ancient India. Walsh notes that these views were similar to those of Ajita Kesar Kambali, who is one of the uh, prominent Samana philosophers of the Buddha's time. The Buddha of Saitavya, the people of Saitavya, I should say, of all classes, go out the north gate to visit Kasapa because of his reputation as a great teacher. The prince gets wind of this and tells the people to wait, uh, exactly as in the other Siddha, uh, because he would like to join them, apparently with the intention of refuting the view that there is in other world devas and karma. He describes the people of Setavya as foolish and inexperienced. Therefore, Prince Payasi and the people of Setavya went to go together to see Kasapa. The prince tells Kasapa that there are no other world, no devas, and no karma. Kasapa opines that he has never heard such a view before, an unlikely assertion, so he asks the prince to explain himself. First, Kasapa asks the prince whether the sun and the moon are in uh, this world or another, and whether they are devas, uh, spontaneously born, or humans. What he's doing, of course, is he's asking a series of questions uh, of uh, the prince, providing an opportunity to him to explain his point of view. So Kasava asks, are there a sun and moon in this world? Are the sun and moon in this world or another? And are they devas, uh, spontaneously born, or humans? Previously, I've mentioned that the word deva literally means shining being. Tamil Cube, the online Pali uh, dictionary, or one of the online Pali dictionaries, also has sky, rain, cloud, celestial being. So according to this view, devas clearly include what we would call inanimate phenomena. Elsewhere, the Buddha, uh, the Buddha refers to that, uh, and it is the Buddha this time, we're referring to another sutta. Elsewhere, the Buddha refers to the sun and moon as devas too. The prince agrees that they are in another world and that they are devas, not human beings. Although this isn't the only argument that Kasapa makes, it is the first one. Clearly this question and the answer imply a way of thinking that is difficult for us to comprehend. It also clarifies the early Buddhist conception of devas. Although devas occupied higher worlds than that which we inhabit, there is an area of overlap where devas and humans interact. The conception of devas themselves clearly differs from our own, in that the sun and the moon are included in that category, as the etymology also implies. At the same time, other descriptions of devas in the Pali Canon, the majority, clearly imply that devas are sentient beings with individuality, somewhat different from our conception of the sun, moon, and stars. Of course, if mind or sentience is the underlying reality of everything, then everything is potentially sentient, even natural phenomena, rather as in the spiritual conception of the Native American peoples. Now, however, I do not believe that we need to accept the sentience of stars to comprehend Kasapa's argument. I do not think that he is necessarily saying that the sun and moon are devas. Rather, his argument is that they occupy a higher world, therefore Payasi is incorrect in his fundamental assertion that there is no other world. Although that would appear to be the immediate implication, the fact that it does not convince the prince uh, suggests that Kasapa is only making an analogy. Otherwise, it would be absurd for the prince to reject his argument. What Kasapa is saying, I think, is that look at the world around you. We look up into the sky and we see that there is a world above and a world below, and that the world above is populated by stars or luminous beings. In the same fashion, if we see that the world is like this, then it is logical to suppose that there must be a higher world populated by superior beings. This is coming very close to Giordano Bruno's assertion that there are other worlds populated by sentient beings, for which he was burnt at the stake by the Roman Church. Perhaps the regularity of the movement of the sun, moon, and stars also suggested the law of karma to Kasapa. However, the prince does not agree. So, consequently, Kasapa challenge, challenges the prince to give reasons for his denial. 
We see here a kind of formal dialectical structure playing itself out, similar per perhaps to the pedagogical dialectics of the Tibetans. In reply, the prince tells Kasapa of an ingenious experiment he conducted in which he asked friends and family members, both good and bad, uh, <laughs> oh, look at that. Sorry, I've mis just miswritten something here. So he asked friends and family members, both good and bad, um, who are sick and close to death, um, to come and tell him whether there are another world, devas, and karma. However, no one ever appeared to him, therefore he inferred that there is no such place. That's not that dissimilar from uh, s certain types of uh, pacts that are made, uh, people make today, uh, to the same effect, some of which have been documented by uh, parapsychologists. Kasapa's somewhat mischievous reply points out that it might not be physically possible for the deceased to return to the earth from the hell worlds any more than it would be possible for a thief to delay his execution. Kasapa's reply may imply that he believes that the hell worlds are guarded by actual wardens or warders, or it may simply be a turn of speech. In any case, the obvious answer to the prince's argument is that he can't know that the conditions of rebirth in those worlds would allow such a return. Thus, the absence of a return may simply mean that it is not possible, not that such worlds do not exist. Materialists make similar arguments today. With respect to the good people with whom the prince has made uh, this pact, uh, Kasapa suggests uh, that the earth plane and human beings are so repulsive to spiritual beings that no one would return to the earth plane to fulfill his pledge. The actual words in the text are, in just the same way, Prince, human beings are unclean, evil-smelling, horrible, revolting, and generally considered to be so by the Davis. And the Prince rejects this argument, too. The next argument is, uh, is similar to the former one, except that it specifies being reborn as a companion of the 33 gods specifically. You'll recall that, that the realm of the 33 gods is the, uh, the uh, truncated apex of Mount Sumeru, whereas the realm of the four great kings is, uh, occupies the four slopes of uh, Mount Sumeru. Kasapa makes the fascinating response that this too is impossible, because the rate at which time passes for the companions of the 33 gods is faster than it is for human beings, significantly faster. So that even after a very short time, after being reborn in the world of the 33 gods, the prince himself will be dead. Kasapa even gives us the ratio of the time difference. One human century is, equi is, equivalent, <coughs> is equivalent to a 24-hour day in the realm of the 33 gods. Uh, that is a ratio of 1 to 36,525, based on a 365.25 day year. Uh, that is the number of days in a century. And this means that the companions of the 33 gods vibrate at 0 0.999999926252086 of the speed of light. And you can actually, if you want to translate that into an actual number in kilometers or miles per second, you can look it up online and do that. There's the actual number there. This effect is called the Lorenz contraction. It's very interesting that this crazy idea that the rate at which time passes can vary according to frequency or vibration reappeared in 1905, 2,300 years after the Power Nirvana, when a 26-year-old patent clerk by the name of Albert Einstein proposed the theory of relativity. The devas, of course, are luminous energy beings. This is explicit in the Pali Canon. So even in terms of relativity theory, this statement makes perfect physical sense. Consequently, the faster they vibrate, the more slowly time will pass for them in terms of the human frame of reference, hence the longevity of devas referred to throughout the suttas. Kasapa points out that being unable to perceive a thing is no proof of its non-existence, 
any more than being blind proves that light and color do not exist. Of course, this does not prove that they exist either, so Kasapa recurs to his first argument, stating that there are a sun and a moon that is higher luminous beings, therefore such beings uh, do exist. So it's not quite clear whether Kasapa actually regards the sun and the moon as devas, and if so, what that, does that mean? Um, or whether he's simply using it as an analogy. Furthermore, Kasapa tells the prince that the other world cannot be seen with the physical eye, but is seen with the divine eye, which is possessed by the ascetics and Brahmins of the forest. It's interesting also there that he includes Brahmins in that category. So there are clearly uh, Brahmanic Samanas living in the forest, which he includes as, ha as having the divine eye in a truly non-sectarian way. This eye, when purified, and that's the words, uh, the word used in the Siddha, purified, exceeds the powers of human sight and includes the other worlds and devas. Therefore, it can be experienced. The prince is incorrigible. He rejects this argument, too, despite Kasapa's demand that he, uh, that he uh, accept it. However, the prince replies that if the higher worlds are so great, and the ascetics and Brahmins know this as a matter of personal experience, and therefore as a matter of certainty, why don't they all kill themselves? That they do not do so proves uh, that they do not have this knowledge. However, Kasapa replies that they do not kill themselves because of uh, what he calls hidden dangers, quote unquote, presumably associated with the consequences of karma. He compares killing oneself to a pregnant woman cutting open her belly to discover the gender of her child. And the exact words in the Siddha are, uh, the lady took a knife and going into an inner room, cut open her belly, thinking, if only I could find out whether it is a boy or a girl. And thus she destroyed herself and the living embryo, note that phrase, and the wealth as well, just as fools who do who seek their inheritance unwisely, heedless of hidden danger. That ref if we choose to interpret this parable as a parable, that is, as a, an expression of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an allegorical teaching, this reference to the living embryo is very interesting because it does suggest the uh, Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha nature, uh, or the, the imminent clear light that indwells every person. So if we make, take that interpretation, Kasapa is more than hinting that attempting to, uh, to achieve uh, enlightenment through suicide uh, is actually uh, going to have the opposite karmic consequence. Um, the implication is that such an act would actually undermine the accomplishment that is being sought. Instead, the ascetics and Brahmins wait for that to ripen which will ripen in its own time, creating ever greater merit for the welfare of others out of compassion for the world. This description is nearly that of a bodhisattva. Remember where we're quoting it from. It's from the Pali Canon, so that's a very interesting uh, correspondence. And the exact uh, language of the Sutta is, quote, those ascetics and Brahmins who deserve morality and are well conducted do not seek to hasten the ripening of that which is not yet ripe, but rather they wisely await its ripening. Their life is profitable to those ascetics and Brahmins, for the longer such moral and well-conducted ascetics and Brahmins remain alive, the greater the merit that they create. They practice for the welfare of the many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the profit and benefit of devas and humans. So that des description is, more, is actually much more like the description of a bodhisattva uh, than an arhat, and very unlike the uh, Jain conception of uh, complete non-action, uh, which is based on the classical Indian doctrine of karma, which the Buddha uh, innovated upon. In another sutta, some of the monastics actually did kill themselves while the Buddha was on retreat, an action that the Buddha condemned upon his return. The prince is still not convinced. Kasapa yields to the prince and asks him to present another reason. Kasapa's rather gruesome example amounts to his not seeing the soul leave the body at death. 
even when the deceased has died in a sealed container, uh, the details uh, of, the exper of the exact experiment are given in the Sutta, and I'll refer you to that. Therefore, the soul should be sealed in the container with the body until it is opened, but when it is opened, nothing is seen. Kasapa's response implies a shared belief uh, that the soul leaves the body during dreaming sleep. The prince is a napper, and when he naps during the afternoon on the roof of his palace, hunchbacks, dwarfs, young girls, and maidens attend him. An interesting glimpse of the life of a governor of a town in 5th century BCE northeast India. Yet Kasapa points out none, none sees his soul entering or leaving his body at this time, so why would they see anything at death? The prince, still not convinced, gives another reason for his disbelief. The prince says that a live man is lighter, softer, and more flexible, whereas a dead man is heavier, stiffer, and more inflexible. He contests that this can be proved by weighing the man before and after his death. I confess that why this disproves the other world is not clear to me. Possibly the text has become corrupt. Kasapa argues that the prince's own example proves the opposite that the fact that the lightness, softness, and flexibility have gone out of the body shows that something has left the body, just as an iron ball is lighter, softer, and more flexible when it is hot, burning, and glowing. This is reminiscent of claims by some spiritualists and others that experiments have shown that the body loses a minute amount of weight at death. Uh, however, these results are highly contested and uh, widely disbelieved, even in the parapsychological community. The prince is still not convinced. He cites another example, similar to the one he cited before, concerning seeing the soul emerging from a man half dead, even when he is beaten in various ways. And the Siddha, again, goes into quite a bit of detail on this experiment, which you can look up for yourselves. Moreover, although he has senses, he does not see the other world. Presumably, he's still able to speak and was cooperative. However, Kasapa argues from the same example that in the absence of life, heat, and consciousness, which he compares to a man, effort, and wind, the body is not animated, thus proving the reality of another world. Or at least of a soul, which in turn implies another world. Once again, the prince is not convinced and produces another argument. This argument is nearly identical to the former one, in this case, instead of being a half-dead man, they are, are beating a half-dead man, I should say, they progressively strip away a man's body parts, starting with his skin, obviously killing him in the process, yet no soul is to be found. Finally, Kasapa, frustrated perhaps, tells the prince that this, his way of conceptualizing the other world is faulty, which is why all his arguments come to naught. The prince is clearly a materialist <coughs> because his arguments only work if matter were the only reality. Even in that context, the argument has little merit since material things pass through uh, other material things all the time, a gas through a membrane, uh, a fish through a net, etc. Even matter exhibits degrees of subtlety. The prince now seems to recognize the legitimacy of Kasapa's viewpoint. But at the same time, he refuses to give up his opinion because it has been uh, broadcast about uh, and giving it up will damage his reputation. Remember, he's the governor of a town, so his reputation is important to him. At this point, uh, the argument changes fundamentally. We're no longer in the realm of arguments against. Instead, we're now in the realm of personal reasons for. Therefore, Kasapa turns his attention to Payasi himself and tells him a series of stories designed to discredit his point of view uh, on a per somewhat personal uh, level, including the story of a foolish caravan leader who, being told by an untrustworthy stranger that there were plenty of grass, water, and wood ahead, discarded his supplies of water, grass, and wood, and subsequently perished. After some further exhortations by Kasapa, the prince finally admits that all he was really looking for from Kasapa was a good argument. At least that seems to be uh, what our translator, uh, Maurice Walsh's uh, interpretation. 
In summary, the prince's argument amounts to little more than the assertion that because he has not seen or heard any evidence for of the other world, he disbelieves in it, whereas uh, Kasapa's argument is that it is known and seen by those who know where and how to look. The prince converts and takes refuge as a lay follower of the Buddha. The question of the existence of the other world, devas and karma resolved, the prince goes on to ask Kasapa for instructions on how to prepare a great sacrifice, presumably to honor his conversion to the Dharma. Kasapa tells Payasi that animal sacrifice has no merit if the participants follow the wrong path, the antithesis of the Noble Eightfold Path, and he goes into the same, uh, break, he breaks down the wrong, the, no, the wrong path, an ignoble wrong path, if you like, uh, in the same terms as the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, except, of course, in each of the terms in the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, right thought, right livelihood, etc., are inverted and called wrong. So that's the wrong path. In a strange anticipation of Yeshua's parable of the seeds, Kasapa tells the story of a farmer who sowed bad seeds in a bad place. He did everything wrong. On the other hand, a sacrifice where nothing is killed and the participants follow the Noble Eightfold Path has great merit. What kind of sacrifice this is is not explained in the Sutta, but it seems Kasapa is referring to the Sangha, the members of which conduct the great sacrifice of collective renunciation. Subsequently, the prince established a charity, but grudgingly, not with his own hands and without proper concern. When Uttara, his Brahmin administrator, who distributes the prince's largesse, grumbles about the quality of the merchandise, Payasi tells him he expects to be rewarded for his generosity, and he tells Uttara to do it if he wants to, that is to distribute the superior merchandise himself, if, he, if, that, if that's of a concern to him. Because of his stinginess, Payasi is born in the world of the four great kings. We have established in a previous sutta that that, of course, is the uh, lowest superior rebirth um, of a, um, a, a Buddhist practitioner, the next realm above the uh, human realm. And for a monastic, of course, Payasi is not a monastic, but for a monastic to be re uh, born, in the, the realm of the four great kings would be considered to be an embarrassment. It's not considered to be any great attainment. Uh, so he's born in the world of the four great kings in the empty uh, Sarasaka mansion. Search as I might, I can't find any information on the uh, Sarasaka mansion uh, online, and Walsh does not footnote it. So I have no further information to give you about that, except it's a division of the realm of the four great kings, and it's empty. In any case, Uttara was born in the higher realm of the 33 gods. This story is, shown because, is known rather, because the venerable uh, Gawampati, Gawampati, one of the Buddha's early converts, had the habit of napping in the lower heavens. Uh, I wonder if this is a reference to lucid dreaming. And he encounters Payasi in the empty Sarasaka mansion, and Payasi tells him the story. Uh, with respect to uh, the rather unusual uh, locale uh, of napping uh, for a mid-afternoon nap of uh, the uh, four great kings, the realm of the four great kings and, uh, and other lower heavens, uh, we should also remember, uh, if you attended my talk, on the famous translator Mrs. C.A.F. Riss Davids, which I gave a while back, uh, towards the end of her life, she claimed for herself that she had actually uh, attain, attained uh, this uh, ability herself. Uh, during the dream state, she said that she would visit Deva worlds. And she is considered to be one of the great Buddhist translators of the 20th century. So the Sutta ends with the pious advice to the reader to be ungrudging in generosity in order to obtain a better rebirth. Um, the prince's arguments that the other uh, world, devas and karma, do not exist boil down to the argument that he has never seen physical evidence of such things, including a soul living the leaving the body at death. Therefore, they do not exist. These arguments are not too dissimilar 
from similar arguments that are made today based on the view that only matter is real. On the other hand, Kasapa argues that the other world, devas and karma, are observed in the heavens, uh, are observed rather in the heavens, and ascetics and Brahmins also perceive them with the divine eye. Therefore, such things do exist, that is to say, they are a matter of experience. In fact, in modern times, there is uh, good circumstantial evidence for some of this. Uh, Robert Almader, in his book, Death and Personal Survival, and I will actually I'll put these books in the chat if you're interested in pursuing this research further. Robert Almader, in his book, Death and Personal Survival, gives us very good evidence for ghosts, which he says are as uh, the evidence for which is as good as the evidence for the past existence of dinosaurs. And I should point out that Robert Almader is a doctorate, holds a doctorate in uh, philosophy of science and logic, and has written extensively and published peer-reviewed articles on the philosophy of science. Uh, Davis or UFOs, and for that you sh should look at the work of Jacques Vallée, and Rebirth, and for that you should look at the work of Ian Steve Stevenson or Stephenson, uh, he published a number of books, but uh, the summation of his life's work, I believe, is uh, the book 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. So that completes the Siddha. The Payasi uh, Siddha is the last Siddha of the second section of the Digha Nikaya, called The Great Division. Next week, we will begin to review the third and last section of the Digha Nikaya, called the Pataka Division, uh, named after the title of the first Siddha of that group. There are 11 Siddhas in this group, which means that we should finish the series of talks on June 14th, assuming that there are no, inter are no interruptions. So next Sunday at 2 o'clock, we'll be discussing the uh, Padaka Siddha. So that completes the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Before we uh, conclude with the dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit of this talk to all beings. Does anyone have any questions or discussion that they would like to have concerning anything uh, to do with this today? I'll give you 30 seconds. If no one says anything, we'll proceed with the dedication of merit. Okay, it seems there are no questions. So let's conclude with the dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit of this talk to all beings. Whatever understanding, whatever positive force has come from this, may it go deeper and deeper and act as a cause to reach enlightenment for the benefit of all. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again to discuss Dharma. It is my pleasure and privilege. Uh, if anyone would like to carry on uh, this discussion in the chat, uh, you're invited to uh, Zong Zung Sim, which is the Sim of my group, the Dharma Transmission to the West group, which is located in the Visit Atoll Sim. I'll be hanging out there in the circle for a little while, and if you're interested in having an informal chat, uh, you're welcome to join me there. So thank you very much. Namaskar. <laughs>